All right. I am really happy to introduce Dr. Clifford Hume and this topic on dizziness and vertigo in the elderly, um, something that we have not covered before, and yet it's just so important. Dr. Hume is a UW Associate Professor of Head and Neck Surgery and a researcher at the Virginia Merrill Blodell Hearing Research Center. He has clinical practices at UW Medical Center and VA Puget Sound, where he is Chief of Otolaryngology. And as I said, he's going to talk with us today about dizziness and vertigo in the elderly. Welcome, Dr. Hume. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thanks for inviting me. I'm excited to talk to you about something that I'm um, very interested in and I think very relevant um, to the elderly uh, population. And um, get these to advance, right? So we're going to start off with describing some of the impact of dizziness, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and also establish a framework of some terminology I think is helpful in communicating both with patients, but also with other providers. We're going to go over sort of a standardized approach to diagnosis, both the history elements as well as the physical exam, and then review some of the common causes of vertigo and the ways that um, we might treat them. And end with some suggestions uh, as to when it might be appropriate to refer um, to either to us in otolaryngology or to physical therapy or for further testing and so forth. So um, dizziness is an incredibly common problem. It, it comprises about 15% of primary care visits and probably close to half of that can be peripheral or vestibular in origin, but there's also a large component of other diagnoses uh, and that includes cardiovascular disease, neurologic problems, psychogenic dizziness, and quite a few actually that where it's difficult to actually identify actually what the cause is. And this of course is only those that are showing up in primary care. And there are many individuals that have chronic or episodic dizziness that are actually never evaluated in the medical system. And that's part of the challenge we have too, is trying to get this information out of patients when they're not necessarily bringing it up on their own. And it's important to remember this has a, a pretty profound impact on patients' well being. This is especially the case with the elderly, whereas if uh, we look at the prevalence, uh, it's uh, fairly low in the younger individuals, but as we get over the age of 85, 50% um, of people might uh, experience dizziness in the course of a year. And again, although many of these causes might be benign, they still result in many uh, visits to the to the medical uh, professionals, results in lost work, decreased participation in social activities, problems with their gait, potentially risk for falls, which can result in injuries such as uh, fractures. And we know also that even a fear of falling is one of the biggest risk factors for falling. So multiple ways that it can impact um, patients' lives, even if it um, may not be uh, life-threatening in most situations. And what's intriguing is there's more and more information that some of the aspects of the interaction between the vestibular system and decline in cognitive function. So one of the issues we have is terminology. What do we mean by dizziness? There are many different ways that uh, patients and providers can refer to some of these symptoms. And part of the challenge is because it's a subjective experience, it's very difficult to put it into words. And this can be uh, part of the frustration from, from both parties. So one area that I think is helpful is to try to establish a baseline terminology that's shared. And this is through a, a working group, the International Classification of Vestibular Disorders, and some of the uh, um, definitions that they arrived at. So we, when we speak of dizziness, we're referring to a spatial disorientation without a sense of motion, whereas vertigo is either self-motion when there's no motion occurring, or a sense of distorted self-motion during normal movement or a sense that the environment might be moving. Whereas unsteadiness is something which can occur even when we're seated, um, but it can also be when standing uh, or walking. And it's probably this, you know, a similar thing we might call disequilibrium or imbalance. Now, presyncope, of course, is sort of relates to the level of consciousness. So an impending sense of loss of consciousness or uh, fainting. And then syncope obviously is associated with uh, actually a loss of consciousness with generally short duration, but full recovery. But during that loss of consciousness, there's a loss of postural control. 
I want to spend a little bit more time on the idea of vertigo and oscillopsia. So vertigo, as I mentioned, is an illusory sensation of motion. It can be rotational is usually what we think of, but it can also be linear. So people can feel like they're being pushed or shoved or uh, uh, falling. Oscillopsia is something that can be related and it's a sense that the environment that somebody is visualizing is moving. So as opposed to the sensation of movement, um, it's actually a sensation that the visual environment is moving. And this is also a property of some vestibular disorders. So we'll come back to this as well. We're gonna focus primarily on those that relate to vestibular symptoms. So dizziness, vertigo, and unsteadiness. And all these can occur either with peripheral vestibular disorders, central uh, neurologic disorders, or combinations of these. And what we're going to go through in the next uh, little bit is some of the diagnosis, how we stratify the risks and the treatment plan, also to help uh, under the patient understand what the prognosis is, uh, depending on what their diagnosis. If we look in a specialized dizziness clinic, the frequency of some of these syndromes um, is uh, uh, varied. So about half of them are peripheral vestibular in origin, whereas there's a smaller percentage that's uh, central vestibular. Um, and you can see that even in the peripheral vestibular uh, diagnoses, there's quite a range. So we have benign paroxysmal positional vertigo being the most common, but these other peripheral disorders that are in yellow here, um, still each one of them makes up a significant component. So there's a wide range of potential diagnoses. And these vary by age. So again, in a specialized dizziness clinic looking at 500 consecutive patients, there's a different spectrum of diagnoses that occur in individuals that are less than 40 compared to those that are over 80. So if we look in the younger population, which is the lighter gray bar, this is persistent uh, postural perceptual dizziness, vestibular migraine. Those tend to be the most common. Whereas in the older population, we see bilateral vestibular hypofunction, um, uh, BPPV, very common, and central vestibulopathy. Uh, so different diagnoses may tend to be more common uh, in different age groups. So to set a baseline, we want to talk a little bit about what the vestibular system is and how it's important for these symptoms. So it's one part of an integrated multi-sensory uh, network of sensory information and data storage. And it's a coordinated set of reflex pathways that maintain posture and balance. The primary ones we think of are the visual system, proprioception, and then the integrative uh, capabilities of the central nervous system. But it also involves um, muscle uh, motor control, uh, cortical awareness, and cerebellar uh, uh, function with the reticular formation and the extra pyramidal system. A simplified way to think of it in talking to patients that I often use is as a three-legged stool, where to maintain balance, we have the three primary sensory uh, modalities um, that are the, the legs of a stool. And the brain is really what stabilizes the information that's coming in and coordinates that information so we can perceive our orientation in the environment. So a disruption of any one of the legs of the stool or multiple legs of the stool can lead to a sensation of imbalance or potentially um, to dizziness or vertigo. Going back to the vestibular system, this is a view of the labyrinth. It's shown in relative to the head that's kind of shadowed in behind here. We have the cochlea, the auditory portion of the inner ear. And then the vestibular system, the vestibular labyrinth with the three semicircular canals, the utricle uh, and the saccule. And obviously this structure is mirrored on the contralateral side. If we look inside the vestibular system, there's actually five different balance organs that are shown here in the darker purple. And if we look in the semicircular canals, which are uh, ro uh, angular uh, acceleration sensors, there's the cupula, which is overlaying the hair cells. This is an entirely fluid filled system. So when the head turns, the fluid moves and deflects the cupula, which triggers the uh, uh, discharge uh, to the uh, vestibular uh, nerve going to these uh, hair cells, resulting in a change in the uh, afferent input to the vestibular nuclei. In the otolithic organs, the utricle and the saccule, we have the same types of hair cells also embedded in sort of a gelatinous structure called the otolith, uh, 
On top of that are these calcium carbonate crystals. So when there's acceleration or tilting or changes relative to gravity, there's a shear force as these odiconia shift the stereocilia on top of the hair cells. And again, leading to a, a triggering of increased discharge from the afferent fibers going to the vestibular nuclei. We have to remember that even though we think about these canals as the, for example, the superior canal, the horizontal canal and the lateral canal, the way we describe them doesn't actually match their anatomic orientation. And this can be important when we're trying to assess their function in a patient, but also um, in, in uh, just understanding the physiology when we're trying to uh, uh, observe things like nystagmus that we'll talk about later. So the horizontal semicircular canal is actually oriented about 30 degrees off of vertical, as is the utricle. Um, and if you look here from the top down, the anterior or superior semicircular canal is angled at about 45 degrees relative to the front, whereas the posterior canal is angled about 45 degrees um, towards the back. So what this means is any movement is going to trigger multiple canals at the same time, as well as potentially triggering the otolithic organs. All this is integrated into the central vestibular nuclei. So the, here's the peripheral vestibular ganglion. This is the, uh, the vestibular nucleus with multiple sort of subdivisions within that. There are also direct connections from the vestibular ganglion to the cerebellum. And then there are the uh, reflex uh, arcs that connect to the ocular motor nuclei, and then eventually up to the cerebral uh, cortex. We can think about the primary roles of the vestibular system as coordinating a set of reflexes uh, that are important for maintaining vision and posture. And so the primary one we're going to focus on today is the vestibular ocular reflex or the VOR, but also there's the vestibulocolic reflex, so connecting to the neck mus musculature, and we'll uh, briefly mention that a little bit with some of the testing, and then the vestibulospinal reflex, which again is going to be related uh, to posture. So here we have the connection between the vestibular labyrinth, and in this case, showing the horizontal semicircular canal through the um, vestibular nuclei and then connecting to the ocular motor, ocular motor nuclei on the ipsilateral and contralateral sides. And in this case, uh, when the head moves in one direction, there has to be an equal compensating eye movement in the opposite direction to keep the target uh, of the uh, retina focused, uh, focused so that there's not a blurring of vision. So when we think about describing the eye movements, we're going to uh, refer to nystagmus. And really the nystagmus, uh, the pursuit or the slow phase is what's controlled by the vestibular ocular reflex, whereas the fast phase is the corrective saccade when the uh, eyes move back to the primary position onto the target. If your vestibular ocular reflex doesn't work in a horizontal plane, something you're looking at like this basically is blurred. So we're not able to maintain visual fixation on a target and we have a blurred image um, uh, when, we, when we try to read something or if we try to watch an object that's moving. Um, Oscillopsia is a similar sensation. So if somebody's walking and they don't have a vestibular ocular reflex, they're gonna notice a bobbing or rocking of their visual field which of course can be very distressing and disorienting. So how does aging affect the vestibular system? So it affects it at multiple levels. In the peripheral system, we know there's a loss of vestibular hair cells starting really at birth. And this occurs uh, more rapidly in the ampullae, so in the semicircular canals compared to the otolithic organs. There's also a change in the afferent fibers in the ganglion that begins at a somewhat later age and then uh, accelerates again with aging. There's also a mechanical change with, uh, in otoconial stability that we'll come back to later that affects the frequency of some of these disorders that we see in aging, especially, uh, uh, specifically uh, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. There are also changes in the central vestibular nuclei, although this are, these are less dramatic. Um, and despite all these changes, it turns out that when we do tests of vestibular function, there are surprisingly uh, small changes until very late uh, aging. And that's probably because they're very robust pathways of the uh, central vestibular system to compensate for losses peripherally. But there are two disorders that are very common with aging. One is what's referred to as presbyvestibulopoly, so aging of the vestibular system. It's um, 
uh, characterized by uh, decreased balance, gait abnormalities, dizziness, falls. And this is really primarily a situation where there's a gradual loss of vestibular function uh, in the peripheral organs uh, that were the compensation can no longer completely uh, account for this. There's also multisensory dizziness, combining the loss of vestibular function with visual loss and proprioception obviously leads to a decline in, in, in function as well. Dr. Hume, I just wanted to mention um, if you could remember to um, identify acronyms, this audience, some of these are not like um, easily retrievable. Okay, <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll try Thanks. to do better at that. I'm gonna come back to some of these later. So the key to diagnosis for vestibular disorders like uh, many uh, medical conditions is really often related to history and some focused elements of the physical exam. And we're gonna go over these in some more detail as we go forward. So especially for vestibular disorders, the timing of symptoms and triggers to the sensations that they're experiencing are critical. In the physical exam, there are a few specific um, uh, exam uh, components that I'm going to talk about in more detail, the dix hall pike test, the head impulse test, observation of nystagmus, and the test of skew. And the acronym for this whole series of exam uh, components is called the HINTS test. We'll talk a little bit about testing, but really not very much um, today. So again, the keys to diagnosis, timing, and triggers. So when we talk about short-lasting episodes of vertigo, lasting seconds to minutes, especially if it's provoked by position changes, the most common diagnoses are gonna be benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. There are some examples of cervical vertigo where head turning as opposed to uh, position change relative to gravity can be a trigger. There is also dizziness that's triggered by sound and pressure changes which would be more consistent with the superior canal dehiscence. Sometimes a fistula can have similar findings. In the intermediate time frame where the vertigo lasts from minutes to hours, the most common uh, conditions will be vestibular migraine and Meniere's disease. When we get on to longer chronic uh, symptoms of dizziness lasting days to week, these will more typically be vestibular neuronitis, labyrinthitis, again, migraine, and then some other conditions that I won't spend a lot of time on, but primarily related to central neurologic conditions or medications. And then there's a group that we'll mention at the end where patients have extended amounts, usually uh, greater than three months of vague dizziness, very difficult to describe, often non-rotary um, in the way they, they experience it. And the most common things that, uh, that are responsible for that are chronic subjective dizziness, also known as persistent postural perceptual dizziness and Malden de Barkman syndrome. So we're gonna cover primarily the ones that are highlighted in blue in this diagram. So if we think about the same um, uh, concept, the symptoms in this diagram are represented um, by the color bars. So vertigo is sort of the uh, tannish bar, unsteadiness is the bluer uh, kind of a teal bar, and then dizziness is, uh, the, the pinkish uh, colored bar. In persistent postural perhaps perceptual dizziness, um, these symptoms are nearly continuous and patients primarily describe them as dizziness or unsteadiness. Whereas if we look in a patient with benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, they're primarily describing a sensation of vertigo as opposed to this the dizziness, which they may have on a more continuous basis, but uh, they also experience that short um, duration uh, of vertigo. Now this contrast with migraine, where you can see that they pretty much have a wide range of duration of symptoms as well as types of symptoms. And so in many cases, uh, sorry, in some cases, there can be not a single diagnosis, but multiple diagnoses. And people may also have overlapping symptoms, even though we're gonna try to simplify it somewhat today. So multiple diagnoses can coexist. In terms of the exam, I think this is a very useful kind of way to think about a focused um, structured exam for patients that are having uh, vestibular complaints. So it's the, called the 10 minute dizzy exam. It was um, popularized by Dr. Goebel at WashU. And these are the components. So looking for spontaneous nystagmus, um, observing the vestibular ocular reflex, which we'll talk about, um, tests of coordination, uh, observation of gait, tests of central ocular motor function, 
the Dix Hall Pike test, which again we're going to go over, um, observation of posture and some tests of posture, and then the test of skew that we're also going to go over. And for some of these tests, it's helpful to have uh, some glasses that remove the ability to stabilize vision with uh, visual fixation. So using uh, Fresnel glasses, these are a little hard to come by and very expensive. But if you're looking to improve your ability to do some of this exam, these glasses are actually very helpful. And I use these myself in clinic. They're a Fresnel lens, they're called M glasses. You can get them from several different sources, but they're actually relatively inexpensive and they work quite well for removing uh, visual fixation during a vestibular exam. So when do we wanna do the Dix-Hall Pike test? Um, most people are familiar with what it is. Maybe not always exactly confident about how to perform the exam or how to interpret it. One challenge we have is the Dix-Hall Pike test is very underutilized in a number of studies that have been done. It's uh, approximately 50% of the people that probably should have had it done in an emergency room setting actually have it performed. And it's often performed on patients who actually weren't appropriate candidates to have it performed. So the Dix-Hall Pike test is really an examination for individuals who are describing brief episodes of vertigo lasting la uh, less than a couple minutes, and it's episodic or intermittent. It's evoked by a change in position relative to gravity or head movement relative to gravity. Um, it's not present when they're sitting still, so it doesn't occur just spontaneously when somebody's sitting uh, reading or you know sitting at the computer. And it's not accompanied by any focal uh, neurologic uh, symptoms um, such as uh, dysarthria or something like that. So this is an example showing how to do the Dix-Hall Pike test. In this case, where the left posterior semicircular canal is affected. So um, in this case, we have the head turned towards the left side, and we're going to tilt the patient back, inclining the head so that the axis of the head is 20 degrees relative to horizontal. On the right-hand side of this figure, you can see where, in this case, um, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo is caused by dislodgement of those otoconi that I mentioned into one of the semicircular canals. In the most common variation, it's in the posterior semicircular canal and it's represented by these little black um, dots here. So as we go through the positions in this diagram, it shows the orientation of these canals um, so that you can see what happens with the otoconium. So as the patient turns their head to the side and is reclined, you can see that the otoconia move inside this canal as the, as the head moves back, they shift inside and they generate a current essentially in the fluid which causes that cupula inside the semicircular canal to deflect and stimulates a nystagmus. So if the patient is looking at primary gaze, there's a rotary nystagmus that's upbeating. So in this case, in the left, uh, in the, when the left posterior canal is affected, it's a clockwise nystagmus that's upbeating. One of the characteristics of benign paroxysmal positional vertigo is that if you change the eye, the gaze position, when they're, when they're experiencing the nystagmus, the nystagmus will change. So if they look away from the affected ear, so if they look up, the nystagmus becomes more vertical, whereas if they look down, so um, towards the ground, the nystagmus becomes more torsional. And so these properties that change with gaze position and triggering by gravity are pathognomonic for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. So there are multiple variations. We have three semicircular canals on each side. So you could affect any one of these canals. It turns out the posterior semicircular canal, just by virtue of the anatomy that it's the most dependent uh, canal is the most frequently affected. So that's the way you can sort of remember, remember its orientation, but probably around three fourths of uh, uh, BPBV is caused by the posterior canal. And it's uh, characteristic nystagmus is as I showed you in the last diagram. So it's an upbeating torsional nystagmus um, whereas the horizontal canal is a horizontal nystagmus and the anterior canal is a downbeating nystagmus, sometimes with a slight torsional component. So remember that the semicircular canals, if they're being stimulated, can only induce a nystagmus in the plane of a semicircular canal. So if there's a pure vertical nystagmus or pure horizontal nystagmus without any torsional component, those actually can't be generated uh, by the vestibular labyrinth. So those are some distinctions we'll come back to with trying to separate vertigo that can be central versus a peripheral cause. So what happens to the vestibular system 
peripherally during aging in uh, related to BPPV. So these are some studies from many years ago, back in 1976, showing the very uh, crisp, clear crystals of calcium carbonate in the utricle in a young individual. You can see this sort of trigonal shape um, that's very characteristic. But with aging on the right side of this diagram, you can see a little bit of pitting in the otoconia. With aging, you can see these sort of, it almost looks more fibrous in appearance and even breaking apart with some debris. And again, the, the kind of the really defined geometric sort of shape is lost uh, over time with aging. And part of that is that they also become more easily dislodged. So not only do they change their shape and become less uniform, but they're also lost. There is some evidence that uh, BPPV incidence is related to vitamin D and calcium deficiency. So this was a study just uh, recently where they looked at uh, vitamin D and calcium supplementation and the likelihood of BPP recurrence. So if we look over time, those individuals that were supplemented over uh, about a year period with vitamin D had a lower incidence of recurrence compared to those which uh, did not have the intervention. And then in a, a meta-analysis of six different studies, a similar finding so that there's some evidence that at least in individuals that are vitamin D deficient, supplementation with vitamin D and calcium may decrease the risk of recurrence of BPPV. So this is something that I do for my patients that have recurrent BPPV. Is it always benign? So it turns out that if you look in individuals that are diagnosed in the emergency room with BPPV, that if you look over a long period of follow-up, in this case, eight years, there's a higher incidence of stroke in these individuals. So the, the question of why is still not clear, but it may be that the increased incidence of BPPV in those who presented is related to some underlying vascular disease that predisposes them to other conditions as well. Acute vestibular syndrome is really one of the areas that it's important to distinguish between a peripheral and a central cause, because really what we're trying to rule out is the possibility of a stroke versus something like labyrinthitis or vestibular neuronitis. So acute vestibular syndromes uh, defined as many hours or days of constant ongoing vertigo. It's worse with head movement. It's often associated with nausea and vomiting. These individuals have problems walking and they have a nystagmus, which is either spontaneous or in some cases gaze evoked, particularly as, as time goes on, it may be gaze evoked and not spontaneous. So how do we distinguish these? And this is going back to what I mentioned before and the HINTS test, which again stands for head impulse test, nystagmus and the test of skew. And this is really what should be, uh, be performed as part of the critical part of the exam in patients that are acutely symptomatic. So in the head impulse test, it's a test of the vestibular ocular reflex. And in this test, if there is a peripheral loss, the test will be abnormal. And I'll show you an example of this in a minute. But basically, if you turn the head quickly, the vestibular ocular reflex is not able to stabilize the eye position and there's a catch-up saccade. Um, this test would be normal in stroke because the vestibular ocular reflex should not be affected. Nystagmus is another observation that we'd want to make especially in regards to the fast phase direction, which is describing the corrective saccade. In a peripheral lesion, the corrective saccade is always gonna be in the same direction. So if they have a vestibular neuritis, no matter which direction they look, the nystagmus is gonna stay going in the same direction. Whereas in a central nystagmus, what you might find is the nystagmus, if they're looking to the left, may go one direction. If they look to the right, the direction of the nystagmus is gonna change or they might even have a vertical nystagmus. Test of skew relates to the, um, the vertical alignment of the pupils, and we'll go over that test, which is called the alternate uncover test. In a normal uh, uh, peripheral, in a peripheral lesion, that test, the eyes would remain aligned, whereas in a central uh, uh, condition, such as a stroke, you would find that the gaze is disconjugate along the vertical axis, and we can see that when we allow refixation. So this is an example of the head impulse test. And in this case, there's a weak labyrinth on the left side. And as you see the video, um, 
excitation of the labyrinth is going to be shown by the canal flashing blue, whereas inhibition is going to be shown by the canal uh, uh, flashing red. And we'll see what happens with the labyrinth when we move the head quickly. This is a, an app that you can get for iOS. And I think you can also get it for Android. It's called AVOR, which is very helpful. And if you're interested in kind of getting a better feeling for what happens in different types of peripheral and central vestibular disorders. So, and then the finger here is showing that you're asking the patient to fixate on your finger um, as you're moving the head quickly. So moving the head back and forth, you can see the canals being stimulated with this normal head movement. So nothing's happening on the left. With a quick movement, you saw a corrective saccade there. Towards the left, there's a corrective saccade. So when the head moves towards the affected ear, there's a catch-up saccade. So that's the head impulse test. When looking for skew deviation, in the normal situation, if we cover one eye with, and usually in the, if I'm doing this in an exam, I just use a white piece of paper. So where you're standing in front of the patient, you cover one eye with a white piece of paper and you're watching the pupil. So as you remove the cover from the eye, you should see that the pupils are aligned in a vertical plane. So that would be the normal situation. An abnormal test showing skew deviation, if you have the eye covered, you can see the pupil is deviated below. So when we remove the, uh, the uh, cover, remove the piece of paper, we can see the eye correct. So you'll see the eye move back so that it realigns in the vertical plane. And this is the alternate eye. So if in this case, the eye is covered, the pupil is deviated up. When we remove the cover, the eye goes back down to realign. So this refixation is what's abnormal. So in the normal situation, when the eyes, when one of the eyes is covered, the pupil should remain in alignment. When you remove the cover, there shouldn't be any corrective uh, refixation uh, saccade. The other eye should remain aligned. One way to look at this, um, it's sort of a, a, a flow diagram to think about diagnosing these sorts of acute vestibular disorders was, uh, it's called timing triggers in a targeted exam, the abbreviation then is titrate. So uh, in this case, if a patient presents with the symptoms we've been talking about, the critical things are, are the symptoms episodic or continuous? If they are episodic, are they triggered or are they continuous? If they're triggered, the key uh, component is the physical exam and the Dix-Hall-Pike test. In this case, if the symptoms are continuous and spontaneous without a positional trigger, the key physical exam finding is that uh, HINTS exam. And the whole uh, goal of following this sort of a flow sheet is to try to identify the peripheral disorder, disorders and a treatment plan versus um, the ones we're concerned about, which would be a central disorder such as a stroke. And this, uh, the HINTS test that I showed you, again, in the, in the setting of using it in the emergency room, has been shown to be um, equally as sensitive as an MRI in the first 24 to 48 hours uh, for detecting a stroke, uh, probably uh, close to as uh, specific as well. So um, very useful uh, part of your armamentarian for examining patients with these symptoms. So the key, uh, key components are the history, as I mentioned, episodic versus continuous um, vertigo, and then um, the key exam findings, uh, the HINTS exam, and the Dix-Hall-Pike test. So those are really the critical things uh, to be uh, familiar with. So what are the goals of treatment in patients that are experiencing vertigo or dizziness symptoms? In the acute setting, obviously the treatment's primarily symptomatic, so to blunt the vestibular uh, uh, system and the autonomic responses, the nausea, potentially vomiting that they're experiencing. Uh, in the more recurrent, episodes of vertigo or chronic symptoms, the goal is to restore a steady state balance of inputs and try to prevent these recurrent episodes. In some cases that might require a stabilization with a procedure or potentially an ablation of an unstable labyrinth so that central compensation can occur and the patient's symptoms can improve. There are a number of modalities that we use. Uh, we already talked a little bit about physical therapy, 
um, but we'll come back to that in more detail. Uh, medications can be very helpful, especially in the acute setting. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, surgery. So in BPPV, which we went through already, this is an example of how the Epley maneuver is performed. In this case, the affected canal is the right posterior semicircular canal. So we're gonna follow this individual around the circle um, with the positions and in the middle shows what's happening with the otoliths. Um, so in this case, the otolith starts off in here in position A when the patient's um, sitting upright. And as the patient is rotated sequentially through these positions, you can see that the otolith uh, debris gradually moves through the canal back to the common cruise between the superior and posterior canals and drops into the utricle where it's not gonna cause the symptoms of dizziness. So in this case, we turn the head uh, so the affected ear is uh, down, tilt the patient back again with the head tilted back at least 20 degrees like I showed you in the first uh, image. The head is then quickly turned to the opposite side and that's when the debris is shifting again over towards the, uh, the other limb. And then uh, the patient puts their nose 45 degrees towards the ground and that's allowing that debris to drop back towards the utricle and then they sit back up. And this can be more effective if it's repeated. So often in, in my experience, I'll usually do this twice. You'll see that it will improve after each treatment. Um, and that's, kind of, that's uh, probably where at this point, I would probably refer them also on to physical therapy in case their symptoms uh, recur. So the key is identifying the canal. And that's again, what we would do by using the strategy I mentioned before, by observing carefully the trigger for the nystagmus and its direction. Medications um, are a mixed blessing with dizziness. So they're very useful in the, the treatment of symptoms in an acute setting, but they're also a very common cause of dizziness. And this is particularly the case in the elderly. In terms of treatment, there are multiple classes of medications that can be used. Most of these are symptomatic in the sense that they blunt the vestibular uh, system, either peripherally or centrally, whereas others are antiemetics. And there are many classes of medications, whether they're anticholinergic, antihistamines, benzodiazepines, calcium channel antagonists. Um, there are some more specific directed treatments for different types of recurrent dizziness. Those are primarily directed at uh, migraine. And there are a number of uh, uh, different classifications that can be useful in migraine, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, uh, the serotonin antagonists, and more recently, the CGRP pathway, the, the GPANTS. Um, can also be used to treat uh, different types of uh, dizziness uh, symptomatically. So the choice of drug is really dependent on the goal. So in the acute setting where patients are experiencing severe symptoms, obviously more sedation is actually beneficial. So that might be in the acute vestibular syndrome. Medications that I would tend to use would be promethazine or lorazepam because they have a fairly long half-life. And basically we want patients um, they don't mind if they have to sleep some, they get some rest, the symptoms are minimized so that they can get through that couple days it might take for, for them to get uh, back where they can resume normal activity. Now for patients that are having recurrent episodes of dizziness, we obviously want less sedation because you might have to work through these um, episodes and they don't wanna be on these more uh, sedating medications on a chronic basis. An example of this might be Meniere's disease. Medications typically use uh, for these patients might be meclizine or diazepam, which again have fairly long half-lives but tend to be less sedating. Medications really don't have any role in treating BPPV or bilateral vestibular hypofunction, which as I mentioned before, are some of the most common causes of dizziness uh, in the elderly population. So you need to be very careful whenever you're considering uh, giving medications uh, in the elderly because of the more common diagnoses. And really the goal in all settings is to minimize suppression uh, and sedation so that compensation can occur and the patient can recover and get back to uh, normal life. So I wanna spend a little, a few seconds on uh, polypharmacy, again, very common in the elderly. This is a list of medications that can cause dizziness. Uh, we're not gonna go through the whole list, obviously, uh, but it's quite extensive. So many medications taken for uh, different conditions that become increasingly frequent in the elderly can cause dizziness. And if you take multiple medications together, that becomes even more of an issue. This is an example that was performed in uh, Ireland over a, a 15 year period, looking at different age groups and the percentage of 
uh, people uh, prescribed more than multi more than one medication. And if we look here in the group of patients over 65 years old, most of these were taking at least um, six medications. So um, very common problem uh, in the elderly. And this population is sort of probably a similar uh, distribution of what we would see in our uh, Medicare uh, population. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about more directed medical and surgical treatment for some of these disorders, focusing on Meniere's disease, uh, migraine, superior semicircular canal dehiscence, and postural perceptual, uh, persistent postural perceptual um, dizziness. Meniere's disease, I think uh, even though it's a relatively rare condition, I think it's one that people often tend to think of when they think of uh, vertigo. It was first described many years ago. The strict definition is two episodes of vertigo lasting 20 minutes to 12 hours. It's associated with a hearing loss that typically is low frequency as shown in this uh, audiogram here where there's normal hearing in the right ear that's in red and there's a low frequency, low uh, uh, hearing loss in the left ear, the left ear that's sensory neural. There's generally an associated tinnitus in the affected ear. So in this case would probably be a left um, tinnitus. And in some cases the hearing loss can precede the vertigo. The age of onset is usually 20 to 50 years old and a significant number can progress uh, to become bilateral. So what is Meniere's disease? The other name for it is called end lymphatic hydrops and that really reflects what we think is the origin of this condition. So a dilation of the end lymphatic spaces was first described many years ago. And if, we, if you remember back to the anatomy of the uh, labyrinth, there are three different fluid spaces. There's the endolymphatic space, which is in the light green color and the perilymphatic space, which is in the darker blue. And they have a different chemical composition. So in endolymphatic hydrops, there's a dilation or increase in the volume of this endolymph space at the expense of the uh, volume of the perilymph. And it's the breakdown and uh, the, the distinction between these two fluid compartments that we think is responsible uh, for the symptoms. This just shows a histologic section through the cochlea. So this is a normal cochlea. These are the turns of the cochlea. This is the scala uh, tympani, the scala media, and the scala vestibuli. And in this case, if we look at a higher magnification of this area, in the normal situation, there's sort of a triangular space that's the smallest of the fluid spaces, that's the scala media. Whereas in Meniere's disease, this, this uh, is ballooned out. So this, what's called Reisner's membrane, is very distorted reflecting the increased uh, pressure in the endolymphatic um, space. Over the past decade, we can also evaluate this to some extent, even in individuals without doing histology on their temporal bone. So this shows an MRI image. This is the orientation of the labyrinth up here. So here's the cochlea and the vestibule and the semicircular canals. If we look at a cross section, um, this shows the scala media where this fluid space, which is black, um, is the endolymphatic compartment. It's probably easier to see on this, uh, this picture here. The endolymphatic space is black. And normally we'd barely be able to see these spaces, but it's very easy to see that the scala media is very dilated in this individual, as well as in the, uh, in the vestibule. So with MRI, it gives us a possibility potentially to get some more information uh, on diagnosis uh, through imaging instead of uh, cadaveric temporal bones. So how does the pathology the dilation in the lymphatic space matched to symptoms. Part of the problem we have with understanding Meniere's disease is that we do also see hydrops in individuals that don't have any symptoms. So we still don't really have a good understanding of the underlying biology that leads to the symptoms, although the hydrops does seem to be a commonality in most individuals. There is a number of theories that have been proposed, whether it's autoimmune, infectious, or genetic, one that we're gonna come back to in a little bit is a neurovascular hypothesis, um, which suggests that there may be changes in endolymphic dynamics that are caused by a neurovascular phenomenon, which overlaps with what we see in migraine. So there's a lot of overlap between Meniere's disease and vestibular migraine. So they each can be uh, defined by vertigo symptoms, tinnitus, hearing loss, and oral fullness, whereas uh, Meniere's disease has a progressive sensory neural hearing loss. Vestibular migraine is more specifically characterized by photophobia, phonophobia, and the headache, although in vestibular migraine, uh, headaches are not actually required. So I like to think of migraine as a sensitivity 
uh, of, uh, sorry, as a syndrome of sensitivity to multiple types of sensory stimuli, which is also something shared with Meniere's disease where patients are very sensitive to motion. So vestibular migraine is defined as five episodes of vestibular symptoms lasting five minutes to 72 hours. So I wanna contrast that to Meniere's disease where the symptoms really only lasted up to 12 hours. They have to have a current or previous history of migraine. And then these episodes have migraineous features, which can be headache, um, can be exacerbated by physical activity. They may have the photophobia or phonophobia. Typically these are bilateral. They may have auras, but they also can have vestibular symptoms such as a spontaneous vertigo. They can have VPPV type symptoms. They can have visual vertigo. They can have motion induced, induced vertigo. But it's also important to remember that the headache in migraine and the vertigo can be independent. So we often see individuals who may have had more classic uh, migraine symptoms with a headache when they were younger, but as they uh, get older, especially we see this in women who are postmenopausal, may have only vertigo symptoms without any headache. Also remember that migraine is much more common than Meniere's disease. So probably 18% of women have uh, migraine less frequently in men, but many people with migraine have episodic vertigo. This is a much larger portion of the population than the 0.2% of the population that has Meniere's disease. So probably at least an order of magnitude more common uh, than Meniere's disease. So the key with symptoms with uh, individuals who are experiencing episodic uh, vertigo or persistent vertigo with a diagnosis of vestibular migraine is to ask the questions. Many times individuals don't realize that their symptoms of dizziness could potentially be a migraine because they haven't had migraine for many years. So always ask about a history of headache, ask about the photophobia, phonophobia, ask about predisposing factors related to diet, sleep disruption, history of sleep apnea, effects of hormonal changes, uh, which can either be related to aging or potentially hormonal supplementation, and vertigo that lasts more than 24 hours that would not fit in the category of Meniere's disease. Migraine also has a very strong uh, potential family history. And uh, individuals with migraine often will describe a history of severe motion sickness when they were children. So it does appear there might be a continuum potentially between Meniere's disease and migraine. And one of the underlying hypotheses for migraine is called the trigeminal neurovascular efferent hypothesis. So there's a release of peptides at the uh, uh, synaptic junction, particularly uh, CGRP, and uh, that may cause inflammation uh, in the surrounding vessels, lead to vasodilation uh, and plasma extravasation that eventually causes the symptoms that we relate to uh, a migraine. We do know that the vascular supply and the innervation of the inner ear is also related to the trigeminal nerve. So we can sort of think of the inner ear as being another tributary of the trigeminal nerve that also innervates the dura and may be responsible for the migraine headache symptoms. So a lot of overlap, and I think it's still unclear how much of Meniere's disease may be somewhere along that continuum of a migraine. So again, just reviewing some of the mechanism for how migraine might happen. So there's the reflex activation of the trigeminal nerve, release of CGRP leading to vasodilation, a change in uh, electrolyte balance, and that depending on where these symptoms are, where these uh, changes are occurring, if they're happening in the inner ear, they could be responsible for the dizziness, the tinnitus, and the hearing loss. One of the challenges with assessing outcomes of Meniere's disease is the unpredictability of the course. So many uh, patients with Meniere's disease have a uh, progressive uh, improvement in symptoms where the dizziness symptoms may stabilize even though they lose vestibular function. So they have fewer and fewer severe attacks. Um, but uh, this also makes it a challenge to tell if any intervention is actually improving things because a significant portion of uh, patients in a placebo group also uh, improve. The primary treatment for Meniere's disease is a low salt diet. Uh, advice about stress reduction, caffeine, nicotine sensation. I often use the same sort of dietary recommendations we would use for patients suffering from migraine. So keeping a diary can be very helpful. At a secondary level, patients who with Meniere's disease who do not respond to conservative measures, we often will put on a diuretic such as a diazide 
There's also some evidence that beta histine, which is a, uh, a weak uh, agonist at the histamine H1 receptors can also be beneficial. This is not, a, um, uh, not available uh, through formulary in the United States, but some patients actually will get this in Canada. For a severe acute uh, symptoms, these individuals sometimes respond to steroids, either given orally or injected through the tympanic membrane. But overall, about 80% of patients with Meniere's disease can be managed medically without any surgical intervention. Vestibular migraine, similar sort of pattern. So the primary intervention is diet and lifestyle, uh, recommending keeping a diary. There's some good studies showing that supplementation with magnesium and vitamin B2 can be helpful with severity and recurrence for migraine. At a secondary level, there are a number of different classes of prophylactic medications, uh, most commonly topiramate and uh, diltiazem, as well as some of the serotonin family of medications um, can be useful. And then more recently, uh, the CGRP uh, uh, family of uh, medications and blockers, the, the G-pants and so forth. So typically in my practice, when we're getting into this level of uh, intervention for migraines, I'll uh, sit, uh, send these patients to neurology where they can also have some other more directed interventions related to biofeedback and some of the cutaneous nerve stimulators. We're gonna move on to treating some of the treatment uh, options, oops, uh, related to surgery. So it's a very small percentage of patients that fail medical management for uh, dizziness that I mentioned. So these are typically those who experience Meniere's disease or superior canal dehiscence. BPPV is really not a surgical disease. Labyrinthitis, really not a surgical disease. Uh, Perilymphatic fistula, we're not going to talk about, but it's more of a functional uh, repair of a fistula in the inner ear. So the goal for surgery really is to try to stabilize the fluctuating peripheral vestibular function, which obviously involves identifying the offending ear. And we won't spend a lot of time talking about testing, but often that will be identified by the specific symptoms they have related to hearing loss if we're talking about Meniere's disease. Potentially that will require vestibular testing in the balanced laboratory, but the goal is to obtain a stable ear that will allow central compensation. So there are some procedures that can potentially stabilize the ear without eliminating function. And one of these is what's called endolymphatic sac surgery. It's diagrammed here on the right side. This shows the ear canal here. This is a mastoid, a surgical mastoid cavity. This is the horizontal semicircular canal and the posterior semicircular canal. The endolymphatic sac is buried deep in the bone here. And through this surgical approach, it's exposed and decompressed um, with the idea being that this surgery will change the dynamics of endolymph flow and lead to an improvement in symptoms. One of the challenges with this endolymphatic sac surgery, as well as many interventions for uh, Meniere's disease, is that it's very difficult to do a uh, placebo control and um, evaluate uh, definitively the effects of uh, our interventions. Um, but the idea of affecting endolymph dynamics um, seems to have some validity. Uh, the other option that I mentioned is transtympanic injections, which again, both would be uh, options for stabilization of function of the ear without removing function. So the advantage of the SAC procedure is that it's an outpatient surgery. People do generally very well. Um, complications are very rare. Um, as I mentioned, there has a questionable benefit in a number of studies, but others show that it can be beneficial. One of the challenges we have is that if patients are very disabled, if we have something that has a very low risk profile, what else do we have to offer them? And that's uh, you know, one of the challenges we have when patients come asking for this procedure. Superior semicircular canal dehiscence was described relatively recently. Um, pathologically, it's a missing bone over the superior semicircular canal. So normally there would be bone present over the superior semicircular canal. We'll come back to this in a second, but when this bone is missing, it changes the dynamics of fluid movement in, inside of the labyrinth, which is responsible for the symptoms. So it's an audio vestibular uh, syndrome, and it's associated with episodic vertigo triggered by loud noise. So pressure on the eardrum causes movement move inside the fluid in the labyrinth and uh, results in these uh, symptoms of dizziness. It can be triggered by sneezing or coughing, lifting something heavy, sometimes blowing their nose, um, they may also have a constant disequilibrium even between attacks. 
They also have a very odd hyperacusis to bone conduction. So some of these patients will describe hearing their eyeballs move in their head or hear their heartbeat. Um, they sometimes will uh, actually hear their feet hitting the hear their feet hitting the ground. So a very unusual and has to do with the change in the dynamics of sound conduction in the labyrinth. On CT scan, I will show you in a second, but there's absent bone over the canals I uh, demonstrated here. And on audiometric testing, they have a very specific type of conductive hearing loss. And there's some abnormalities on vestibular testing that I won't go through in detail. This shows a CT scan. So this is an axial view through the head. And this shows the superior semicircular canal here. If we, recon if we do a reconstruction in the plane of this canal, uh, in this case, white is bone and uh, black is either uh, brain or CSF or uh, perilymph. Uh, fluid, endolymphatic fluid, perilymph or endolymphatic fluid. You can see there's missing bone that, uh, in this area uh, that would normally separate the superior semicircular canal uh, from the, the uh, intracranial uh, space. So the way this happens is that with this dehiscent bone, there is a, what we describe as a mobile third window. So in addition to the uh, oval window and the round window, when there's any pressure inside the intracranial cavity, it causes a deflection through this dehiscent, uh, dehiscence. It causes relative fluid movement inside of the superior semicircular canal that deflects the cupula of the uh, uh, crista inside that uh, canal. And that triggers uh, stimulation of uh, eye movements and the sensation of dizziness. With loud sounds, there's a displacement of the stapes uh, causing fluid uh, movement inside the cochlea. This again is shunted through the semicircular canal because of this dehiscence in bone, and it causes a deflection of the cupula of the superior canal in the opposite direction. So depending on the stimulation, different types of uh, nystagmus could be observed, and they should be in the plane of the superior semicircular canal. So directed vestibular testing can be helpful to really uh, 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 affirm this diagnosis. So the treatment is uh, very straightforward. Conceptually, the bone is replaced either by going in from above, so going in from this direction and placing bone over that canal to uh, re-separate uh, it from the intracranial space. Or in some cases, we go underneath uh, through the mastoid bone and plug it as um, uh, on either side, but both uh, work functionally by blocking this canal. So it's a very well physiologically understood audiovestibular disorder. The symptoms are actually fairly well understood based on the physiology as well. They respond very well to treatment, uh, but it's actually a fairly unusual uh, disorder. This dehiscence of bone uh, over the superior sem semicircular canal is actually identified incidentally in many more individuals than actually experience any symptoms. So whenever somebody has these symptoms, it's important to try to make sure that you're not overlooking a more common uh, diagnosis. We're gonna move on to ablative procedures. And again, the idea is that if there is a constant fluctuation in the peripheral vestibular system, that the central nervous system cannot compensate. And in this case, if medical therapy hasn't relieved the symptoms or the patient has continuing uh, disability, the real uh, trade-off is the possibility that we may be eliminating vestibular function and potentially auditory function um, and gain uh, a stable situation where central compensation can occur. Now, if individuals are not able to compensate centrally, then even an ablative procedure may not be the appropriate thing to do. So patients with some central nervous system disorder may not do well with the uh, destructive ablative procedure because they may not be able to compensate. Another condition where we would wanna be very cautious is if the other ear is also uh, affected by a vestibular disorder as might be the case in Meniere's disease where some patients have a bilateral vestibular disorder. So again, need to be very cautious with ablating vestibular function uh, without a clear diagnosis and uh, identification of the affected ear. So the conditions that might typically be appropriate would be Meniere's disease affecting a single ear, post-labyrinthitis where there is a fluctuating peripheral vestibular function that's not responsive to vestibular therapy, a vestibular schwannoma potentially if the patient is not amenable to a surgical uh, intervention and uh, or if the uh, and causing fluctuating symptoms. Typically, these patients have intense episodic vertigo, even though they may be normal between spells, 
Um, and we would want to identify the offending ear, as I mentioned, based on their hearing loss or vestibular testing. Ablative procedures are not for stable, uncompensated lesions. So for example, somebody who had the vestibular neuronitis that we talked about earlier, or labyrinthitis, if they have chronic imbalance with motion-induced vertigo, these patients are not con uh, candidates for an ablative procedure. They're not having spontaneous spells. They have, sponta they have uh, stable hearing. Those individuals should be treated with vestibular rehabilitation. So as I mentioned, this is trading a risk of hearing loss potentially for the control of vertigo. So what's useful hearing? Some uh, criteria that we use uh, are a hearing loss at the level of 50 decibel or 50% on a word recognition test, whether or not they can successfully use hearing aids. What's the prognosis for the hearing loss in the ear? Are they gonna lose the hearing over time at any, uh, uh, even if there is no intervention? And what's the risk of contralateral disease? In the end, this is an ongoing discussion with the patient to decide how disabling the symptoms are and if they, are, uh, if they find that the ear is useful uh, for hearing or not. The most uh, straightforward intervention to remove vestibular function is what's called a partial chemical labyrinthectomy, first described a number of years ago. And it's done, it can be done in a partial setting. Basically, it's an injection of a vestibular toxic medication, the antibiotic genomycin, which preferentially affects the vestibular labyrinth. It's done in the clinic. It takes about an hour to do. And generally after the injection, uh, the patient may have several days where they feel slightly dizzy, typically not as bad as their severe vestibular episodes. And then they gradually compensate over the next uh, several months. Uh, sometimes uh, or frequently we send them to vestibular rehabilitation to help that compensation process. So this shows how it's done. There's basically two uh, openings into the middle ear through the tympanic membrane. Uh, so, and then essentially the middle ear space behind the tympanic membrane is filled up with a genomycin solution. And this results in about 85% control of episodic vertigo in a typical sort of situation with a Meniere's patient uh, and a relatively low risk of uh, hearing loss. Vestibular nerve section is uh, a neurosurgical, neurotologic procedure to uh, cut the balance nerve. It's very successful with a very low risk of hearing loss, but it requires a craniotomy, either through the posterior fossa or the middle fossa. And there are other associated risks related to a craniotomy. And because we're completely removing vestibular function with a vestibular nerve section, there is the uh, risk of chronic disequilibrium from vestibular hypofunction. This has become much less frequent now that we have the chemical labyrinthectomy, which can be done in the clinic without the associated risks of a craniotomy. So labyrinthectomy is sort of the final surgical option for control of vertigo. It involves removing the entire vestibular labyrinth. Um, in this case, it really is only if something like the chemical labyrinthectomy is unsuccessful and it involves complete loss of hearing in the uh, surgically treated ear. There's two different ways to perform this. It can be done either through the mastoid, as I showed in the past, uh, the, in the diagram showing the endolymphatic sac procedure, or it can be done in a very uh, more abbreviated uh, fashion through the ear canal. In this case, we lift up the eardrum and essentially connect the round window to the oval window, which opens up the entire labyrinth and then pack the labyrinth with gentamicin um, so that it essentially removes the, uh, the toxicity of the genomycin removes residual vestibular function. The advantage of this is it's a very short operation, can be done even in patients that are relatively unhealthy, um, but the control rate is probably not as uh, good as a uh, transmastoid uh, labyrinthectomy. Overall, uh, both of these procedures are very effective uh, in uh, removing, relieving symptoms, but they do have the complication of post-operative uh, post disequilibrium uh, because of the loss of vestibular function that occurs with these procedures. So even if we look at individuals over a long period of time, so three to 10 years after uh, a unilateral vestibular loss, either from labyrinthectomy or from vestibular nerve section, there's incomplete compensation. Many of these uh, patients fail our standardized vestibular testing procedures, even though they actually have minimal a handicap and feel that they are functioning quite well compared to their uh, preoperative uh, symptoms. So there are a number of options available for ablation of vestibular function 
in appropriately uh, chosen patients. And really the trade-offs are the degree of function they have remaining in the ear for vestibular function as well as hearing. And uh, that's an ongoing discussion with the patient uh, to decide uh, what their uh, value is of those uh, preserved function. So in the end, uh, the key is that these are elective procedures. We take into account the age and health of the patient and let them decide um, whether they uh, prefer to uh, what uh, procedure they prefer. We're gonna talk a little bit about chronic uh, dizziness, which is uh, something else that we uh, also see. We initially talked about uh, vestibular migraine or vestibular migraine and some of the uh, more structural conditions such as uh, vestibular neuronitis. Um, in some cases, these conditions can predispose in event in individuals through the appropriate set of circumstances to what are termed functional uh, vestibular disorders with chronic dizziness. The most common of these are is uh, persistent postural perceptual dizziness. Much less common is Malda de Barkman syndrome. And really the key here is that there is an inciting event that occurs in the context of certain psychological factors which may predispose them. They can be panic disorders or anxiety, uh, of, of fear avoidance, and then sometimes uh, depression. Persistent postural perceptual dizziness is a non vertiginous a dizziness, dis, uh, unsteadiness, which lasts uh, three months or more. This is a picture of uh, a typical sort of environment that might be a trigger for people with these. This is the um, um, Venetian in uh, Las Vegas, the floor there, would be a typical horrible uh, 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 trigger for patients with this disorder. Um, these symptoms will go on and, uh, for potentially days, but can wax and wane. And visual uh, stimuli are often very disabling, so they may find it very difficult to go shopping. Um, they have find it hard to drive because ongoing uh, lights and so forth can be very disorienting. Uh, repetitive patterns uh, on the side of the road. Typically, this occurs after acute events that can be such something such as in a vestibular event, such as vestibular neuritis. Um, but they also can occur after psychological events. And um, the treatment for this, oh, sorry, the, uh, so we have a, a sort of a predisposing uh, a trigger of some type. In the normal situation, there's an acute adaptation so that the individual can function. And in the normal situation, there's a readaptation of the uh, balance control mechanisms over time. And these individuals with certain uh, characteristics that predispose them to a maladaptation. There is an increased uh, self-monitoring. They develop some different high-risk postural control strategies, and they have this persistent uh, uh, sensation of dizziness and unsteadiness. So in order to readapt them to the uh, uh, normal uh, weighting of these inputs, the primary interventions are vestibular rehabilitation, sometimes combined with uh, uh, either SSRIs or SNRIs, and cognitive behavioral therapy to, adjust, to address the uh, psychological uh, contributors. Malda de Barkman's a, a rare uh, condition. It's a non-spinning uh, vertigo also, uh, but it's more of a sense of oscillation, which is typically present continuously for most of the time. And it, uh, by definition, occurs uh, after an event where somebody is exposed to passive motion. Uh, based on the description, it typically occurs after somebody's been on something like a cruise or a boat trip. Occasionally, it can be visually induced uh, by being in an environment where there's uh, like a windy uh, moving a tent. I've, uh, I've seen several individuals um, or other sorts of a rocking uh, environment. And the symptoms compared to uh, persistent postural perceptual dizziness, individuals with Marta de Bachmann generally feel better when they're moving. So they often feel fine when they're driving but they feel worse if they're staying still. And um, in, in terms of the uh, symptoms they're experiencing, it, with testing, we can sometimes identify a very specific frequency that they uh, can relate by um, trying to recapitulate what they're experiencing. This can be used in some situations combined with SNRIs to develop a very specialized type of uh, physical therapy to reacclimate their vestibular ocular reflex. Vestibular therapy is uh, rarely not a good idea. So we 
try to introduce vestibular therapy, physical therapy, um, very early in the process for really all the disorders that I talked about, especially for um, unilateral peripheral lesions such as BPPV, because individuals may have recurrences, as I mentioned, especially in individuals that are older. They may This may happen again in a few months or in six months or a year, and it's helpful for them to know they have a resource. Um, stable vestibular lesions such as uh, uh, vestibular hypofunction, again, common in the elderly, um, there's a very strong role with vestibular rehabilitation helping these individuals. Um, Meniere's disease, maybe less of a classic role, same thing with migraine, but I still find that uh, vestibular therapy is helpful for educating people about uh, the disorder. Many uh, vestibular therapists uh, who specialize in neurologic conditions also have a lot of experience in migraine counseling and helping them understand fear avoidance for different environments. And there is some more recent uh, evidence that, especially with unilateral vestibular loss, that early intervention actually promotes a better long-term outcome. So it's better to involve um, them early. And I put a reference here as a good source for uh, neuro, uh, neuro PT uh, specialists. When to refer for testing. So this is sort of a, a variation of the algorithm I showed you earlier. So in an acute uh, situation, um, the things we're gonna do are the focus exam, trying to identify those which might have a posterior fossa stroke. For those that have a uh, positive Dix Hall Pike, they're gonna go through canal uh, repositioning if that's not successful in our clinic or in the emergency room, then they might go through vestibular therapy. If they still have persistent symptoms, then they're going to end up in this path where they end up uh, uh, probably benef benefiting from a referral. Same thing for the patients with chronic dizziness that does not respond to vestibular therapy. That's another group of individuals that would probably uh, be helpful uh, for referral. So in our uh, clinic, we can do some of the more focused um, vestibular ocular reflex testing. Um, as well as uh, the audiometric testing and uh, testing for some of the other uh, uh, gait-related tests. Do we also have a comprehensive balance laboratory where we can test all the different components of the vestibular system? And the advantage of testing is that in some cases where patients don't get better, we can do things like estimate the risk of falling using tests like the platform posturography. We can uh, clarify the diagnosis, which might uh, determine if a patient's a candidate for a surgical procedure or a pharmacologic intervention. It also will help define what type of surgery might be indicated. And so those are the, the situations that could be helpful. We also use testing both uh, to provide feedback to our colleagues in vestibular therapy uh, because they can use that information to help direct the type of therapy that they uh, give the individual. Um, we have vestibular testing can provide information both on the peripheral vestibular system. Um, we won't go through the details of this, but these are tests to really assess the individual vestibular organs, as well as the ocular motor system, and then how this information is integrated uh, with the central vestibular system. So uh, vestibular testing can be very helpful with those aspects. So um, the, maybe uh, all this description has made a little bit, <laughs> made you feel a little bit dizzy. Hopefully uh, we've added a little bit of clarity to where to go with um, next steps. If you're struggling with a patient who continues to have either episodic dizziness or persistent dizziness, um, it's not an unavoidable consequence of normal aging. There's a lot of compensation that occurs even in the elderly. And I think with some, um, the symptoms can indicate either a peripheral or a central uh, problem. And it's important to rely on a very focused physical exam and a detailed history to try to align to arrive at a diagnosis so that you can assess the risks as well as direct uh, the treatment. And again, if, you're, if this uh, does not seem to provide the degree of uh, relief to the patient, then vestibular testing or referral to um, otology can be helpful um, to guide uh, further treatment. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you so much. Wow, have I learned a lot. Um, as um, Cynthia said, um, your expertise is really impressive and your commitment to um, explaining and having us understand various types of treatment. So really appreciate it. I do have some questions that have come in. Um, the first one is how much um, effect does hydration or dehydration have on some of these conditions? So um, dehydration, obviously it's gonna certainly, it's gonna fit into the, one of those 
uh, one of the earlier slides with the buckets related to primarily sort of the dizziness, lightheadedness category. So more lightheadedness, obviously it's gonna affect cerebral vascular uh, perfusion if you're, if you're dehydrated. Uh, so typically they wouldn't have abnormalities on some of the physical exam things that I mentioned. Typically their symptoms, they could be episodic, of course, if the, if the, if the dehydration is episodic um, or if it's uh, triggered by uh, postural changes. So we wouldn't expect them to have nystagmus. We wouldn't expect them to have a positive head thrust test. We wouldn't expect them to have uh, you know, a skew deviation. So the physical exam and the history, of course. So trying to really get into the details of what um, the, 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 obviously the dietary history and hydration, other conditions like diabetes and so forth that might predispose them to that or cardiac disease. Um, and any concerns for self-administered Epley maneuvers? There are YouTube videos by physical <laughs> therapists on self-administered Epley maneuvers. I don't think you're gonna cause any problem by doing it. Part of the challenge is, as I mentioned, that we have six semicircular canals, but in the end, it's usually one of the posterior canals. So you got a 50-50 chance. And in general, you're, if you follow the, and there's, enough, there's lots of videos, so there's some that are better than others. <laughs> the only thing that can really happen that's maybe, it's not necessarily bad, it just can be frightening to the patient, is, and I didn't really show it, is that those otoconia, they're moving. So if you don't get better, then you, you go see somebody, you get it treated. But it, what can happen is that you can actually dislodge the otoconia into another semicircular canal. So this can be very um, distressing to somebody. So they start off with having, you know, some type of dizziness where they lay down in bed, for example, and roll over. The typical thing is bending over to tie your shoes, getting something off of a shelf, rolling over to get your phone or your alarm clock. The vertigo starts, it lasts for 15 seconds and goes away, but it happens every day. It's really annoying. So you look up the video, you try the thing, and before you know it, now the vertigo is triggered by something completely different and it's much worse. So, that can be very scary. So they end up with not really knowing now, am I having a stroke now or was this a stroke? Um, so you're, but that doesn't happen that often. So most of the time it's probably fine. Here's an interesting question. Do you see increases in dizziness or vestibular migraine with COVID vaccines? Uh, I would say no. I think, you know, one of the challenges we, that I, I feel we have with all the COVID related things it's gonna take a long time to sort out the data because so many people have been vaccinated or gotten COVID in such a small amount of time that it's really hard to sort out whether or not the incidence of these conditions is higher than they would be in the underlying you know, population. And this is a case for tinnitus, it's a case for sudden hearing loss. Um, there are reasons we might, we, we know that COVID can affect, it can infect the inner ear. There's data, you know, basically histologic data showing that it can. So it doesn't mean that it does. So I don't think we really know yet. Okay. And um, this attendee said that they had a patient start having intermittent dizziness 10 days after a DVT PE on anticoagulation now ongoing chronic intermittent dizziness for four months, MRI, MRA were reported within normal limits with nonspecific findings. Would a tiny CVA be a possibility? Yeah, it's, that's the challenge, right? Is that um, if you have these sort of episodic vertigo and it really is vertigo and you have nystagmus that's triggered by um, either spontaneously or episodically, that an MRI, even you know, the latest, greatest, newest MRI protocol may not detect the smallest lesion. That's a situation where vestibular testing could be helpful because if we, for example, if you did vestibular testing and there is a nystagmus that's not in a canal plane, so if you do positional testing or there's a spontaneous nystagmus that's not in a canal plane, then we know it's not caused by the peripheral vestibular organ. We know it has to be central. Does it mean that it's, um, you know, does it mean it would change what we do? Maybe not if the patient's otherwise symptomatically stable. So it might mean that, yes, there is some central abnormality that's responsible for a central positional vertigo. Um, it would help us understand that. I guess it would help understand that uh, perhaps that there's no reason why, there's a reason why the epilim maneuver is not working because the nystagmus is not uh, consistent with a peripheral cause. So 
in that case, testing could be helpful just to exclude that it's not sort of an atypical BPPV causing it from a different canal or something like that. Okay. And does a history of alcohol or substance abuse increase someone's likelihood of having one of these disorders? Um, so I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. Obviously, acute alcohol uh, intoxication makes you dizzy because it changes the density of the fluid in the labyrinth. So that's sort of one of the explanations why people get dizzy is that it actually changes the, the fluid density in the labyrinth. So there's a relative movement of fluid. Um, yeah, so I, I obviously it can cause central effects too. So I, I don't know of a specific peripheral effect of alcoholism on the vestibular system. Okay. Um, wondering about ongoing intermittent symptom status post whiplash or motor vehicle accident. So that's a complicated one. Usually it's multifactorial. So um, after uh, it's common to get BPPV after a motor vehicle accident or any kind of a head injury. Um, so that means the otoconia have been dislodged and they may be sort of loosened if you want to think of it that way. So they may, may be likely to have recurrent BPPV and it might be in somewhat unusual canals and it might incur multiple canals. But if you have a whiplash injury, you also have muscle strain, you have nerve injury in the neck. And these, because of there's also the vestibulocolic reflex that we talked about, there are extensive neural connections between the spinal musculature and the vestibular system. So there certainly are individuals who can have vertigo and dizziness symptoms triggered by head movement um, that's not caused by BPPV. So the important things in the terms of the exam there are to look carefully for um, triggering dizziness with head movement that's independent of gravity. So an example would be, you know, sort of an ex extreme head turning, which is not changing the position of the ear of the semicircular canals relative to gravity, but it is changing stimulation of the uh, neck afferents and so forth that might be impinging on the vestibular system. So those are some things that could be done. The treatment for those individuals obviously is complex too. So it obviously it it often involves a lot of, um, you know. Um, Rehabil the input of rehabilitation medicine with different, whether it's uh, massage, acupuncture, all kinds of things that may improve range of motion and decrease uh, some of the issues they have related to any kind of a muscle strain in the neck. So um, obviously often a very difficult, long process to recover. Um, back to the question about dehydration, do you have to be clinically dehydrated for dehydration to affect balance? Uh, I'm assuming they mean probably do you have to be orthostatic? Um, so I would say probably no. And what I usually describe to patients is if you're, if you're measuring orthostasis, you're, you're measuring your blood pressure in your arm. It doesn't necessarily, and, and you're obviously measuring a response in terms of heart rate also, but you don't, you aren't necessarily looking at changes in perfusion that are affecting the brainstem. So if somebody might have some compromised basal circulation, they may be more sensitive to some dizziness symptoms with what may seem to be fairly subtle changes in blood pressure or cerebral vascular perfusion. So it's kind of the combination of the whole picture. So I would say somebody doesn't have to be orthostatic by strict definition, potentially to have um, um, lightheadedness or dizziness related to postural changes that might be exacerbated by dehydration. Okay, and then Irene Yang said, this is not a question, but a comment and an appreciation. Um, I am a rehab optometrist with VA Blind Rehab. Often we have geriatric patients with vision loss and concurrent dizziness, vertigo symptoms, visual and vestibular sim systems are so intimately connected as you spoke about today, and vision serves a stabilizing function we often explore from the visual side for these folks with vision loss. So thanks for opening her eyes to perspectives um, from the other side. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've seen some, I, I think, yeah, vision is a, it's a really amazing how the three or multiple sensory systems interact to maintain our balance. But clinically, I've seen some amazing individuals who, who may, for some reason, become symptomatic where they have um, some dizziness symptoms that may not seem very dramatic, but are dramatic for them. 
um, in the situations I'm thinking of, they were very high performing um, athletes. So I've had uh, uh, a young uh, man who was uh, like a BMX, a motocross a cyclist. And then another person was actually a dancer. And uh, when we did vestibular testing to try to see why, why these people were symptomatic, it turned out they had a profound vestibular hypofunction. So they actually had very little vestibular hypofunction, but because they had developed compensatory strategies with primarily vision, but also proprioception, they were able to perform at a very high level. And maybe it was the lack of vestibular function that allowed them to be minimally symptomatic in these conditions. But, and presumably what happened in those individuals was that something caused them to decompensate centrally. And the challenge was for them, they, they, they had such a sort of, if you want to think of it, sort of a massive central compensation that had occurred. Um, it, it, uh, it, it, the impact seemed uh, quite uh, dramatic to them. So yeah, it's amazing how much the vis visual system can, can compensate for vestibular loss. So we actually have a request while I ask a couple of other questions, if you would mind showing again your contact slide. Oh, sure. Just the, okay. la the last slide. Yeah. And Chris Fredrickson is asking, in the way a person can have nausea with migraine without the pain, can someone have the accompanying nausea with vertigo without the awareness of the movement? Interesting. Um, I tend to think of vertigo as a sensation of movement. So I'm not, maybe I didn't understand the question. They can have just nausea, right? That, maybe that's what they mean. Um, can someone have um, accompanying nausea with vertigo without the awareness of the movement? So I, th I tend to define, or that vertigo is defined as a sense of movement. So we wouldn't we wouldn't describe it as vertigo then. If um, you can certainly have. Um, nausea, as an example, you can have a migraine with just nausea with only GI symptoms without headache or without vertigo. Maybe that's what they're referring to. Okay. We'll see if um, Chris chimes back in again. Um, some of the medicines that you mentioned are on the beers list of potentially inappropriate medications like promethazine, SSRIs, diazepam, thiazides. Um, what about short-term use or does the benefit outweigh the risk? Oh, I think you'd have to take it to the individual, obviously. Um, I think some of those medications in a severely symptomatic patient who's basically knocked out with disabling vertigo for you know several days. And obviously we, we, in this case, we've excluded a central cause, but let's just take vestibular neuritis. I mean, literally they're uh, constant disabling, spinning, unable to get out of bed, unable to walk. So even a medication like promethazine or something like that might be indicated in that situation, but you really want to minimize the duration, uh, not only because of the side effects, but also for the reasons because of the interaction with other medications and so forth. So, and in this situation, you obviously, you, you want to try to pick the least sedating medication that provides enough relief that the patient can function and the least the one with the least interaction with other medications. So depending on the individual, it may be a bit of a balancing act with talking with whoever the primary care provider is or whoever else that would have a better feeling for the individual and their sensitivity to medications or what a, what a better choice might be. And some, I've, I certain, I've had individuals who say, I don't really wanna take anything. I feel horrible, but I'm really too sensitive to medications. I really don't wanna take anything. If this is really only going to last a day or two, I'd rather just stick it out. So that happens too. And um, we did hear back from Chris who said that your response was on target um, regarding the awareness of um, uh, okay. vertigo. Um, do you have time for just a couple more questions? Sure. Okay. Um, is there any relationship between sundowning and an increase in vertigo? Hmm. Not that I'm aware of, but I, I guess you could think there would be other things related to um, other, I suppose, visual cues you use for orientation. Just like we see pe people with uh, vestibular hypofunction um, tend to do much worse, obviously, at night. So the worst situation for somebody who, and this would apply to a lot of elderly people, again, 
is, you know, take a couple of weeks ago when we had all that snow in the dark, you know, it's like the worst possible situation. There's no visual reference because what little light you have is, you know, it obscures any landmarks because of the snow and very little proprioception because it's icy everywhere. So all those conditions are horrible for people with no vestibular function. Well, that's a good point. So here's a comment, um, see your thoughts. Um, a quick screen to assess spine neck involvement is to keep the head still and turn the body to see if it reproduces symptoms. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree. I guess I usually think of it doing it the other way around because I have a, I often have the patient seated on the, you know, on a exam table so they turn their head, but there's no reason you couldn't have them turn their body and keep their head looking at a target too. Okay. Yeah. Well, this has just been fantastic. I have to say our, our eyes and our inner ears have been <laughs> <laughs> um, wide open here. Uh, so I really, really appreciate it. Um, thanks very much. I'm going to see if I can't paste the evaluation survey in one more time. And, well, thanks for um, inviting me. Yeah, really appreciate it. Oh, let me see there. Okay. Um, and everyone, we will see you again next week and thanks for your participation and, um, great presentation. Thanks much. Thank you.